I want us to go to Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 to verse 8. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 to verse 8. Um, I don't know, we had an opportunity to go to uh, Malaysia uh, to see Ruth's dad. Uh, thank you for those who've been praying uh, for uh, the family, especially Ruth's dad, uh, who's had some health challenges. We are contending and thanking God for healing in his physical body. Um, and um, I have, a, I, I've, I've, been, I've been praying. And let me just say, we prayed for him, laid hands on him. Uh, he went out under the power of the Holy Spirit. And um, he got up and there was something that had shifted. Something had changed. Uh, he was walking around, moving around, and he even drove us to the airport. Amen. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. You know, it's amazing how the anointed works. Because when we got there, we had a prayer meeting. Uh, we arrived and uh, uh, I met with him and I prayed with him. And... Um, and with the family, we just had a nice, good time there fellowshipping. And uh, he's a man of God. He loves God. He always says, there's no way you come here and you don't get to do something. So he always goes behind my back. And uh, as soon as I get there, I find there's meetings that's been put on. <laughs> and I just do them to honor him because, you know, he loves to sit at the front. And everybody knows that man of God, that's my son-in-law. Bless God. Amen. He, I, I see the pride and the joy on him. So, and, and all the pastors and all the leaders around the city all treat him with such respect because he's the father-in-law of, of the man of God. So I brought a little bit of honor to the family. I thank God for that. And so he organized some meetings, uh, three churches, and we, uh, I spoke in three different churches, ministered in three different churches, and then uh, there was a meeting organized as well to go to the Longhouse. Now, if you've ever been to Borneo, uh, there are people, natives, who live in the bush, in the forest. To get to them, you've got to go, you fly to Sarawak, and, and you have to go on a boat uh, all the way up to the long houses. I don't know if you know what long houses are. Long houses, they, you know, in Africa we have hats where people live in hats, but over there they build one massive long house and the entire village lives in that house, the entire village. And they have partitions for different families within the house. They have a common veranda and the whole house, the whole village, they all live in the same house. Um, they call them long houses. So I had an opportunity to go to a long house. It was uh, out in the bush and um, got there. And uh, you're not allowed to do anything until you see the chief. So I went and saw the chief, and the chief was sick. Uh, he had a problem with his back. I prayed for him, and he was completely healed instantly. Praise God. So he said, go ahead and have a meeting. So we got the biggest um, partition, one part section of the longhouse is like the meeting area. And everybody came. All these people came. They don't have any hospitals there. So all these people came and I had a pastor interpret for me and I started sharing the gospel with these people and I realized that they... Uh, Nobody goes to some of these places. They're in the middle of nowhere. And so I shared Jesus with them, and uh, I realized they are not, none of them had given their heart to Jesus. When I said, who would like to give their heart to Christ after I shared a very simple gospel message, every hand went up. I thought, come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Amen. So I thought I'm going to rephrase this because maybe they didn't get me. Maybe there's Christians here, and they're just being nice. I said, can you ask them? that if they have never said yes to Jesus, they don't know Christ as their Savior, to put their hand up. Every hand went up. And let me tell you, the chief was there and his hand was up as well. <laughs> Hallelujah. So we led them in the sinner's prayer, this entire long house. Every single person uh, gave their heart to the Lord. And I had pr we prayed for the. So, so I got up and I said, is anybody sick? Nobody moved. Nobody. Everybody was very, because they're not familiar with these sort of things. I said, has anybody got any pain, any issue? This guy was sitting there. He stood up and he was an elderly guy. And he came up and, and he told the interpreter he's got a problem with his back. So I prayed for his back and he got in instantly healed. And everybody in the village got shocked. They, have never, they were shocked. 
somebody went out and started telling some of the others who had not come to the meeting and because uh, there were some of them outside smoking and uh, uh, but they left their cigarettes and came into the meeting and let me tell you, all the sick people lined up because they saw a miracle they have never seen before. They lined up, and let me tell you, in the history, 32 years I've been preaching the gospel. I've never been in a meeting where 100% of everybody was instantly healed. Hallelujah. I've got video footage. I'm going to edit it and put some. I'll be put a report up here and and one after the other getting healed i was more shocked than they were i'm praying for them they are saying ah you see their faces and then one man comes up and he was blind and i thought okay lord let's do this because the whole village is watching and so i put my hand on the guy and i prayed for his eyes i didn't even finish he pushed my hand away and he started looking around and his eyes were completely open he was healed hallelujah Amen. Amen. The Lord touched him and the Lord healed him. And, and I started seeing all this miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. We were there till very late and, and sharing with these people. They called every sick person in the entire longhouse. We prayed for them and every one of them got healed. And, and to Jesus be the glory, praise, and honor. Amen. So when we get, got back, I went back and uh, down back to Kota Kinabalu and, uh, and I say to my father-in-law, because I could feel the healing anointed on me. We, we had about three days of miracles, miracles, one after the other of miracles. And so I called him, I said, I know we prayed when we landed, when we got here, we prayed, but I feel something on me right now. I said, come back, I want to lay hands on you. Because you just come back from this place, there's so much faith. And so he came back and I laid him, bam, that's when he hit the deck, amen. First time, it was very, very nice religious praying time. You know, everybody prayed, we agreed. Thank you, Jesus, wonderful. But I thank God you know, those meetings were organized because you stir something up, amen. Hallelujah. So I prayed for him and something shifted, something shifted. Of course, uh, he's going to get to the doctors and, and let us know what has happened to him physically. So tr we trust in God that, that if God can do it, amen? amen. Hallelujah. That, that uh, chief of the village, he said, can you come back again? And this time we're going to send you to some other longhouses. Now, some of these places, you literally have to go th three, four hours by road. And then you may have to go two days on a boat up a river in the middle of the bush in some of these places. And you get there, you go see the... the, the, the and now, these guys used to be headhunters. Some of those villages, they still have skulls that they, they from the not recent ones, you know, from... You know, they inherited. <laughs> they were headhunters. You can actually, you Google and you see th what they look like. And uh, they actually, this is from the people they killed back in the, in the, in the ni early 1900s. And the, so these were inherited. Like this cow, my grandfather, my great-grandfather murdered somebody, you know. And so it's a trophy. They keep them in their homes, heads, human heads, skulls of people. Uh, so I'm telling you, this is jungle amen hallelujah i'm just grateful they don't do that anymore amen amen hallelujah so we're gonna trust god if you're sick in your body and you need a healing touch uh, come after i know we've prayed if you're saying i still i'm still f come after us we'll lay hands on you while the, this stirring is still here amen hallelujah can somebody say amen Glory be to God. Now, let's look at 2 Kings chapter 6. Pastor Jimbo and the team were leading in worship. And, you know, um, we landed yesterday. Um, it was maybe uh, 7.30 in the morning and um, had to drive to the Gold Coast and uh, to Reno and Hannah Fenton's wedding. They got married yesterday. Hallelujah. So Reno uh, and Hannah got married yesterday. I was... Uh, Jimbo did the catering there. Pastor Gary did a fantastic job uh, officiating the wedding. It was just a small backyard type of uh, ceremony. It was wonderful. So we drove, we, we went there, and uh, so after reception, drove all the way back to Toowoomba, go here, maybe 7.30. That's why Ruth and Bentley are not here this morning. They're a bit worn out. Bless God. 
It was a miracle. Driving, let me tell you, maybe we should have slept and driven this morning. Keeping your eyes open is not easy. I was like, Lord, let me get home. Bless God. It was a very big, big, big couple of days. But let's go, let's go to second, what did I say? Proverbs 3, 5 to 8. And uh, we're just going to unpack. As Jimbo was leading worship, the Holy Spirit whispered in my ears, Proverbs 3, 5. And I opened it and, and I began to, uh, as those scriptures um, came, came up in my spirit, the Lord began to speak to me and I wrote down, uh, an outline of what I felt the Lord wants to speak to us this morning. So I'll give you the title of the message after the message. Amen? Because it is fresh from the presence of God. Um, I was praying this morning at home, uh, but I didn't quite hear anything the Lord wanted me to share. But when I got here, just usually during worship, sometimes you'll see me grab my iPad. That's when the Lord's talking to me. And I started to write a few things down. So let's see where, what the Lord wants to give us, but I really got a sense that the Lord wants to speak to us about trust, and, and this is going to be, it's quite a revelation because it's the download in my spirit. I'm just, I'm just saying, Lord, thank you. Uh, verse 5 uh, of to verse 8, it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall what? Direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your, to your bones. Amen. Now, if you, we, I just want to marry this with this particular passage, 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6, and we're going to look at verse 8. And the Holy Ghost is going to speak to us from there. Second Kings chapter 6 and verse 8. The Bible says, Now the king of, of Syria was making war against Israel. And he consulted with his servants saying, My camp will be in such and such a place. Now one of the things we need to understand is that we are living in a time where Satan has declared war on the body of Christ. He has declared war on the saints. He has declared war on the church. And we know this because in, first, in, in, in Revelation chapter 12, the Bible says that war to the inhabitants of the earth. For the devil has come down to you with what? Great wrath. Because he knows his what? His time. His time is short. And so we need to understand that we're living in a time where the warfare is going to escalate. And this, is, this means that because of the escalation of the warfare, we have to pray and ask God to give us the ability. And let me just say this. We have to develop our prophetic ability so that we can be able to hear from God in order to avoid every trap that has been set by the enemy in our lives. Now the Bible says, now the king of Syria was making war against Israel. Now Israel, let's say Israel here representing the body of Christ. It, I know it's a nation, but let's say here representing God's people. He says he was making war against Israel and he consulted with the servants saying, my camp will be in such and such a place. He consulted with the servants. He consulted with the servants saying, my camp will be in such and such a place. Why? Because the enemy knows exactly which path that we tend to path to pass. And I believe that sometimes whenever, you know, we talk about familiar spirits coming from Africa, uh, this is something that we all knew in Africa, that, that familiar spirit, just like when people are born again, God gives you angels to walk and to work with you. Satan always assigns also familiar spirits to follow you from a distance, to learn your ways, to learn what is, what, what, what makes you tick, what can, what can we do to drop, to, to trip you up, what, because you see, Satan is not omnipot, omniscient, how many of you know that? He's not omniscient. He doesn't know all things. But he can read signs. He knows how to read signs. We know that because, for example, he could tell that a deliverer was being born. 
Jesus was being born. But he couldn't tell where or who exactly. So his idea is to kill all the babies in attempt to try and get Jesus. Because he can't really pinpoint where the, the, the deliverer was going to be born. But he can read signs. He knows when God or heaven is up to something. When God is about to do something. He knows how to pick signs in the heavenlies. He can read signs. And, and so when Jesus the Messiah was being born, the Bible says the men from the east came looking, you know, coming to worship him the three the men the, the, the wise men came to worship him and the bible says as they came to worship him uh you know, they passed by because they were foreigners. And so, you know, if you're a dignitary, you're a, you're a government official and you come into somebody's nation, you go to the king first. You know, you go to the state house, to the parliament, whatever, to meet the king. And then you go to do whatever it is in the nation that you are, d that you are supposed to. Because the Bible, this, these were three kings. They were like three dignitaries. So the, the proper thing was to go to the king and to explain why you are in the nation. I, amen? It's like if, if Biden came to Australia, you know, he has to come and exp he just can't just come. Amen. You've got to go and see the prime minister and explain yourself. Bless God. Amen. Unless you're not coming under the, you know, official capacity. And so they went to the king. They said to the king, we're here to worship who? There's a, we have seen signs. There's a king that has been born. And, and, and we believe he's the king of kings, you know. And, and, and there's something supernatural. Now they're talking about the king to another king. And so his insecurity starts to rise up. And, and so the enemy doesn't know where the king is. Because the Lord had already said to these guys after they had gone, don't go back and don't tell him where the child lays. Because his intentions were evil. Hallelujah. How many of you know if Satan knew everything, he would have killed everybody that was trying to kill Jesus? Come on, somebody. Oh, he, he would have stopped every. Because why? The death of Christ was the nail in his own coffin. Was his own defeat. But Satan, these mysteries are hidden to him. And so he has to somehow try to learn how, what makes this person tick. What does this person, how, what makes this person, uh, you know, what are their weaknesses? And he will observe from a distance. So whenever the enemy gets ready to attack God's people, whenever he gets ready to attack, he talks sometimes to his lieutenants. He will talk to his servants. He will say, where do they pass? What, what makes them mad? What makes them tick? What, what, what is that issue that I, that I can use to get into their life so that I can be able to exploit them and bring them under? And so we need to develop our ability to hear from God because I believe in these last days our safety will be in our ability to hear the voice of God. Now the ability to hear the voice of God is not relegated to a ministry office called prophet because Jesus said my sheep will hear my voice. So if you can hear his voice, then you are one of his. You're part of his sheep. Amen. The fact that you are a child of God, you are born within you with the ability to hear the voice of God, to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. And let me just say this. Everywhere Satan sets a trap, God wants to speak to you about those traps. Hallelujah. He wants to talk to you about every attack and every issue that is a pitfall that is there. Today, when we look around, we are seeing so many pastors and scandals in the body of Christ and, and, and leaders falling and all sorts of terrible things happening around the body of Christ. How did these things happen? Satan knew exactly, because you've got to understand, he comes to bring, he, he, he tends to dig a hole and he covers it with some, that's what a trap is. A trap is something that is not designed for you to see. Come on, somebody. It's not designed for you to see. It's, it's, if you dig a hole and you think somebody's going to fall into it, it's not going to happen. But if you put some branches and some dead leaves and twigs over it, then people can really see that. But God can. Come on, somebody. God knows everything. And this is why we need to come to that place whereby we say, God, develop our ability to hear your voice so that we do not fall into the, to the plots and the plans of the enemy. Whatever it is that he's planning against us, we will not fall into it. Now watch what, watch what the Bible says. Now the king of Syria was making war against Israel and he consulted with his servants saying, my camp will be in such and such a place. And the man of God sent to the king, this is Elisha, sent to the king of Israel, saying, Beware that you do not pass this place, for the Syrians are coming down there. 
So the prophet would speak to the king and say to the king, King, don't go down this way because I know you like to go down this way. But on this day, avoid going down this way because there's a plot, there's a, there's a trap of the enemy over there. And God wants you to avoid the trap. So he was speaking to the king, don't go down this way. Stay away from that direction because there's, an, uh, there's a trap of the enemy there. And the man of God sent to the king of Israel saying, Beware, you do not pass this place for the Syrians are coming down there. Verse 10. Then the king of Israel sent someone to the place of which the man of God had told him. So he sent a spy. Go and look and see what's happening there. Thus he warned him and he was watchful there, not just once or twice. So the guy that was sent to look at that place, he came back and he said, you know what? The prophet said is true. Yes, they are. They have set up a camp there. They obviously, they are trying to ambush you. So it is true. Let's trust the word of the Lord. Let's not go down there. And it says, thus he warned him and he was watchful. Somebody say watchful. The Bible says that we are to watch and we are to watch and prayer is not enough by itself. We have to learn to watch as well. And I believe watching where we get the watchman or the watchman anointed or the, the prophetic, unless the Lord keeps a, a, a city, as the Bible says, they that watch, watch in vain. So we have to understand that, that, that as watchers, we need to pray and ask the Lord to open our spiritual eyes so that even though we are prayer people, because if we are prayerful and we do not develop our ability to watch, we can still fall into temptation. Hallelujah. If we're not watching, we can still what? Fall into temptation. What did Jesus say to the disciples when he took them to the top of the mountain to pray, to watch, to, to, during, you know, in, in, in Gethsemane? He went a stone's throw away and he said, watch and pray lest you what? Fall into temptation. Watch and pray. And I think the watching component has been missing in a lot of our praying. Because the watching component is what alerts you to the, to the issues that are ahead. And so we need to pray and ask God to open our eyes spiritually. Somebody say, Lord, open my eyes. Lord, say, Lord, open my eyes. Because if your eyes are open, you will not fall for the, to the attacks of the enemy. As a matter of fact, people whose ability to watch, they have the ability to watch, and not just to pray, but they have the ability to watch, they have authority over the enemy. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Watch and pray, lest you what? Fall into temptation. So he sent a watchman. He said, go and have a look. And this watchman went and came and he verified. And he said, yes, there has been, there's an attack there. There's a, there's, the, the enemy is planning something. So let us not go there. So he understood that this watchman was there for him to help him keep himself in the paths of righteousness for God's, for, for his name's sake. Hallelujah. So we need to develop our ability to watch. We need to develop our ability to hear the voice of God. We need to pray and say, God, open my eyes. Open my eyes. Open my eyes. Now, how do you know your spiritual eyes are not open? We know our spiritual eyes are not open when our lives are full of fear. Come on, somebody. When you have, no, let me just say this. The fact that your eyes are open, spiritually open. You will find the first thing that lives your life is fear. Because right after this, the Bible says when the Syrian king found out what was going on, what did he say? I've got to find the watchman. Hallelujah. He said, I can't get to the king because, if, because of this watchman. This watchman is, is, is foiling every plan, every plot, everything I'm trying to do. So I'm going to have to go after the watchman. Because if I can get the watchman, then I can get the king. Come on. Now what's, happen what's happening? The watchman was with his partner, his, his, his protege, his, his, his mentee that he was mentoring. He was, Elisha was there. And the Bible says that in the night, the enemy came and surrounded Elisha's house. And when Elisha stood up, woke up in the morning, he, he, I can imagine, you know, he would probably uh, ask for his breakfast. Give me some Kellogg's, give me some Nutrigain, make me a coffee, get me some pancakes. So he servant gets up and he goes to the kitchen, opens the curtains, and he panics. Because he looks out and he sees the enemy. 
Now notice, this guy has no ability to see in the realm of the spirit. He panics because he's blind. Do you know the reason why Elisha stands up and he wakes up and he has no fear? It's because his eyes are open. Come on, somebody. He's a watchman. When he looks out, he doesn't just see the enemy. He can see beyond the enemy. Come on, somebody. So he gets up. I can imagine him. I, I think in pictures. Praise God. I see him get up, and I see him walking out, and can you bring the newspaper? And, and his coffee is there. He sits down, and his friend is wondering, why are you not worried? We've been surrounded. He's looking through the front door. We can't go out that way. Through the back door, we can't go out that way. Looking through the windows, we are done for. The enemy is here. He has surrounded us. He is going to kill us. They're going to kill us. Yet you are asking for your coffee and the Sunday times, and you are, you're just acting like nothing is wrong. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. So what does the prophet say? He says, come here. I need to bring you into the dimension I walk in, the ability to see. He puts his hand on his eyes, and he prays that God will open his eyes. And when his eyes are open, something supernatural happens. He goes back, and he looks out the window, and he can see the enemy surrounding them. But surrounding the enemy that was surrounding them was thousands and thousands and thousands of angels. Hallelujah. And so he understood that those who are with us are more. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. I said those who are with us are more than those who are against us. So you've got to understand, I don't care what the devil is planning against you, against your family, what is planning against your family, your finances. Those who are with us are more than those who are against us. First Corinthians, in Revelation chapter 12, the Bible says, when Satan fell from heaven, he took a third of the angels with him. The last time I checked, two thirds was greater than one third. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So if all you're seeing is who's coming against you, there is a problem. Come on, somebody. If all you can see is what's difficult, the closed doors, the impossibility, there's always an issue with your perception. Because God wants your eyes to be open. And yes, you will see the problem. But behind, beyond the problem, there is a solution. Come on. Hallelujah. That's why Jesus wasn't worried when he said to them, you give them something to eat. They were worried. Oh, Lord, what? Let's, Peter, what have you got in your pocket? Thomas, what have you got? Put every, all the money down. Let's count. You know, 5,000 people. We got to feed them. Jesus wasn't worried because he already saw the solution. Come on, somebody. And I found that in life, we will always be in a place of anxiety and fear if all we can see is the problems that are coming against us. We need to pray and say, God, open our eyes. Open our eyes that we may see the solution. Yes, the problems are there, but show me the solution. Hallelujah. That's why the Bible says in 1 Corinthians, and it says, now, now, no, now no temptation has overtaken you except that which is what? Common to man. But with that temptation, God will give you what? A way of escape. So if your eyes are not open, oh my God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You are doomed to fall into that temptation. Because every temptation that comes your way, there is a little doorway that God has for you. There is a hatch that you can step out of and escape that temptation. I don't care what kind of temptation it is, how bad it is, what kind of devil is behind it, what kind of Lucifer, what kind of demon is behind that temptation. With every temptation, there is always a hatch. Come on, somebody. Somebody say an escape hatch. There's always a way out. That is why you need to pray and say, God, open my eyes that I may see the way of escape. How do I get out of this? If you ever see people, sometimes they fall into stuff and they're like, Lord, how, Lord, how do you even escape such a thing? It is possible. Our ability to see. Somebody say, open my eyes, Lord. Because the reason we fall into temptation is because our watching has been taken away from us. Our ability to see has been taken away from us. So we pray, but we fall. And we enter into a cycle. Lord, forgive me. I will never do it again. Tomorrow I do it. The next day, forgive me, Lord. I will not do it again. D do it again. The next day, oh, Lord, I'm, I promise you this time. 
the last time, Lord, forgive me. Help. Next, you enter into a cycle, a cycle because the component of sin has not been released yet. Hallelujah. First of all, let me just say this. It is possible to live holy 100%. It is possible to not fall into any temptation from today until the day Jesus comes. It is possible. And I'll tell you this. The Bible says now, now no temptation has overtaken you except that which is common to man. In other words, and I've preached on this before. With the, when God allows a temptation to come your way, he weighs you. He looks at your ability, looks at what you can handle. Then he says to the devil, thus far and no further. He draws a line of demarcation on the sand. That's why the Bible says that now no temptation has overtaken you except that which is common to, to man. Because Satan has got the ability to bring temptation that is so strong that it can even make angels who stood in the very presence of God and saw his face and saw his glory and live in heaven to turn their backs on him. So that's why the Bible says that now no temptation has overtaken you except that which is common to man. So the Lord reduces the intensity of that temptation and he reduces it to the point that you can handle it. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. First Corinthians 10, 30. No temptation is ever taken except such as is common to man. But God is faithful. Who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are? Come on, somebody. So it is possible to live a sinless life on this earth. There is nothing that is beyond your ability to handle. Come on, somebody. But what does it say? But with the temptation... Uh, will also make a what? A way of escape. So this God has already cooked the entire battle to favor you. Come on, somebody. He has reduced the, the, the strength of the punch. Come on, somebody. He has turned it down, and then he has said, this is your escape hatch here. If it becomes to, listen, you, can escape, you don't even have to deal with, you can just step through here and get out of it. Now, if your eyes are not open, this is why we end up falling. We end up messing up. Come on, somebody. Amen. Now, what happens is he prays for this man. His eyes are open. And the Bible says he's looking out there and he can see not just the enemy, but he can now see what? The angels surrounding the enemy that was surrounding them. Now, this is the really, really powerful part. He says, now, let me, let me just open that. If we go to verse 19, now Elisha said to them, now if you, let's look at verse 16. So he answered, do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. This is 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 16. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. All around. Notice, they were not around him. They were around Elisha. Your eyes are open. That's when you know you're stepping into a new dimension. The Bible says in verse 18, so when the Syrians came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, strike these people, I pray, with blindness. Come on, somebody. Here is a man whose eyes are open, praying that the eye, Satan's eyes will be closed. Come on. Lord, if Satan is looking for my family, blind him. If he's looking for my kids, blind him. He will not find their address. Come on, somebody. He can't find the city they're in. He will look everywhere. He will not be able to find them. Listen, if your eyes are open, you can release blindness over the enemy. Come on. Hallelujah. Because if you can pray for eyes to be open, you can pray for eyes to be closed. Jesus. So it was when, he, now we're in verse 19. And Elisha said to them, or rather, verse, let, let's look at verse 18. So when the Syrians came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord, strike these people, I pray, with blindness. And he struck them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. According to the word of Elisha. Come on. According to the word of Elisha. 
Now Elisha said to them, this is not the way, nor is this the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. But he led them to Samaria. So it was when they had come to Samaria that Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of this man that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes and they saw that they, where they were, uh, that they were inside Samaria. Inside the enemy's camp. <laughs> come on. Now when the king of Israel saw them, he said to Elisha, my father, shall I kill them? Shall I kill them? But he answered, you shall not kill them. Would you kill those whom you have you, would you kill those whom you have taken captives with your sword and with your bow set food and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master in other words there were a message to the master that no matter what you're trying to do whatever you're planning to do it will be frustrated because of the ability of the watchman that God has raised up and is set in his house hallelujah so they were able, and one man was able to capture an entire army. And this is what we need to understand. It wasn't just one man, but it was one man backed up by the armies of God. Hallelujah. So when he spoke, the armies of God responded. And this guy's eyes were blinded, and he took them captive. Took them captive. So let me just say this. We can come to that place where we are watching and praying. We can come to that place where we ask God to give us the ability as watchmen intercessors, as people who stand watch over their lives, over their families, like, like Job used to do for his kids when they would throw crazy parties. He would get up in the morning and he would pray for the family. He was a watchman for the family. That's why Satan said, haven't you put a hedge of protection around him, around his whole family, and around all that he owns? Isn't that right? Even though they were throwing parties because of the watchman, Satan had no authority to reach that family. So, Father, we ask you to open our eyes. Hallelujah. Somebody say, open my eyes. Open my eyes. Now, let me finish with this. This is why I read Proverbs 3, verse 5. And I'm going to finish with this. This is where the, the spiritual warfare is going to come. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Every time God speaks to you as a watchman, this is what you need to understand. The instruction of the Lord does not carry an explanation with it. Hallelujah. I said the instruction of the Lord, anytime as a watchman, and I'm trying to help the watchman now understand how not to mess up as a watchman. Every time God speaks to you as a watchman, that instruction does not come with an explanation. That's why the Bible says here, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own what? Understanding. In other words, and trying to figure everything out is how we as watchmen mess up and we end up in the enemy's traps. Now let me help us to understand what I'm trying to communicate here. When God speaks to you, you have to learn to trust him. Hallelujah. Now the problem with us is that we are conditioned to trust only after an explanation. Come on. <laughs> so you get to the airport, you've planned a holiday, you're going somewhere, and at the airport, the Lord tells you, don't get on that plane. That's all he says. Why? <laughs> He's not going to tell you why. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Because we want to obey God in the place of understanding. I, I, can, I can easily understand. And this is where the enemy comes in. He would now fight you in the realm of understanding. Come on, somebody. And when we reason, we begin to reason ourselves out of the instruction of the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. God may speak to you. And when he speaks to you, he doesn't give you an explanation. He may tell you whatever he tells you to do, do it. So God says to you, go and draw water from the, from the you remember the wedding in Cana? Go draw water from the, the, the vessel. Why? We don't need water. We need wine. Why am I doing that? We asked you for wine. You're telling me to go draw water. You see, explanation. When we come to that place where we require an explanation, we can reason ourselves out of the place where God is speaking to us. But what, what happened? They drew the water and after went, what happened? 
it turned into wine. It turned into wine. Remember what Jesus spoke to the, to the apostles when they were there trying to catch fish all night in the morning. He said, cast the net on the right side of the boat. They could have reasoned. We are fishermen, sons of fishermen, grandsons of fishermen. You are a carpenter. What do you know about fishing? We've already closed the business. We have cleaned the nets. There's a close, close sign. You're telling us to go back and try again. But thank God he did not reason. He said, nevertheless, come on somebody. We can reason ourselves out of our breakthrough. We can reason ourselves out of our miracles. Many times when God speaks to you and he gives you a prophetic word, he does not accompany that with an explanation. Now I want you to understand this. You don't need an explanation when you trust God. Hallelujah. Just trust him. Can I help you here? Just trust him. Now I'm going to say two things. Trust him because of number one. He knows the end from the beginning. Come on. I don't. But he does. So why are we trusting God? When he, tells, when, you, when he tells you, when somebody says to you, you know, proposes to you, and the Lord comes and says, don't marry him. You better obey God. It doesn't matter how in love you are. Come on, somebody. Doesn't matter when you see them, you feel goosebumps and butterflies and everything. You better trust God. Because he knows the end, come on, somebody, from the beginning. He knows the end from the beginning. So trust is based on our understanding that God knows the end from the beginning. Number two, the reason why we trust him is because he has our best interests at heart. Come on. He's not telling you not to go just because he wants to rip you off. Come on, somebody. I remember watching a documentary, and it was a, this guy was talking about, um, you know, the family was going on holiday, Christmas holiday. And they packed everything. They got to the airport. Uh, and it was, I think it was a 700 club testimony some years back. They got to the airport, and as they were sitting on the departure land, they get, uh, bags are in the plane. The Lord said to them, cancel the holiday. Now, kids are here. You know, everybody's wearing their, 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 their coconut t-shirts. How many of you know those holiday Hawaiian shirts? <laughs> everybody's going on holiday. And the Lord spoke to them, cancel the holiday. Thank God this was a man who had learned to hear God. And the family that trusted that dad knows, if dad hears from God, then we will follow what God, dad says. So they said, listen, we are, I've just heard us clear. God is not telling me why. I know we all want to go. I know we've been looking forward to this. We have planned this. But God has said we're, we're not to go on this holiday. And so they told them, they got the bags out of the plane. They gave them uh, their bags and they left. And you know what? A few days later, Boxing Day tsunami. They were going to Phuket. Ground zero. Big tsunami. 200,000 plus people killed. God had spoken. Now, we could have reasoned. God, but, but we have booked holidays. We're, we're going to lose money. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. God never, he never follows it up with explanation. Come on, somebody. If you go and listen to some of the testimonies from 9-11, there was one gentleman, the Lord spoke to him that morning in his prayer time. And he said to him, don't go to work today. And he wrestled and wrestled because, God, I might be losing my job. I might get in trouble. But he wrestled and finally he called them and he told them, I'll come in after lunch. I've got something important to do in the morning. Nine o'clock, the airplane went through his office. Hallelujah. God won't get, sometimes he tells you once, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Every time, and this is what kills us and messes us up as watchmen, is that God speaks words. Let, he doesn't give explanations. But we have to learn to follow the instruction of the Lord. If we can follow the instruction of the Lord, the Lord will preserve us. Now let me finish with this. The Bible tells us regarding King, King Saul. God gave him a very good instruction. He said to him, I want you to go... Let me read this so I can, I can, I can, I, I'll give you the exact, um, this is 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel chapter 15. I'm going to finish with this. 1 Samuel chapter 15. I hope this is helping somebody. Because 
don't worry. I mean, if, listen, go, you may be looking at a house. You may, put, you may say, you know what, I'm going to sign a contract. This is the house I'm going to buy. If God tells you don't buy the house, don't buy it. If there's a house you see and the Lord tells you to buy that house, maybe you're in the market, you're looking for a house, and the Lord tells you, you can get that house. And even when the outside doesn't look like it's, the, you know, maybe we shouldn't get that house. And, but just obey God. God knows exactly what he's doing. Hallelujah. There are cars you could go, deals, contracts, association and connections. God may speak to you and tell you, do not step into that kind of connection. Just obey. Just obey. Don't worry about trying to get an explanation. Trust God in these two ways. Number one, he knows the end from the beginning. He knows what tomorrow holds. And number two, he has your best interests at heart. Hallelujah. He will never ask you to not do something because he has anything other than a good plan for your life. Isn't he, he, it's, it's, didn't he say in Jeremiah 29, he said, I alone know the plans that I have for you. Plans for good, amen, to give you an expected hand. That's the plan God has for you. God's plans for your life are good plans. <laughs> Hallelujah. Because he doesn't want you to marry Saul when there is a David around the corner. Come on, somebody. <laughs> amen. Glory be to God. He wants you to marry a wife, not a knife. <laughs> He knows the hearts of men. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Bless God. And so if we don't hear from God, we may end up in jeopardy. Come on, somebody. Now, let me finish with this. Taking too long. All right, First Samuel chapter 15. Now, God speaks to, to, to King Saul. Samuel also said to Saul, listen to this. Uh, the Lord has sent me to anoint... Um, uh, let's look at verse. Let's look at from verse 1 so we can just get the, the gist of it. Samuel also said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people over Israel. Now therefore heed the voice of the words of the Lord. Heed the voice of the words of the Lord. Those who are called to be kings and priests. Heed the voice of the words of the Lord. This is verse 1. Verse 2. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish, punish Amalek for what he did to Israel. How he ambushed him on the way and when he had come up from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all they have. And do not spare. Listen to this. Attack Amalek, utterly destroy all they have. And listen to this. And do not spare them. But kill both man, woman, infant, nasty child, ox, and sheep, camel, and donkey. So Saul gathered the people together, numbered them in Tel Aim, 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to a city of Amalek and lay in wait in the valley. Then Saul said to the Kenites, go, depart, go down from among the Amal Amalekites, lest I destroy you. Listen, he's been told to destroy everything, to patch that entire thing. Hallelujah. But what does he do? He goes to now his buddies and he says to them, he says, get down from among the Amalekites. He goes to the Kenites. The Kenites were living there. They were part of that group. He said, wipe them all out. And so he says to the Kenites, guys, I'm coming. So can you run away so that you're not caught up in this? Lest I destroy you with them. For you have shown kindness to all the children of Israel when they came out of, out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. Now listen to this. And Saul attacked the Amalekites from Havilah all the way to Shur, which is the east of Egypt. He also took Agar, king of the Amalekites, alive, and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and the oxen and the fatlings and the lamb and all that was good and were unwilling to utterly destroy them. Remember what the Lord had spoken. But everything despised and worthless that they utterly destroyed. Verse 10. Now the word of the Lord came to Samuel saying, I greatly regret that I have set up Samuel as king. So the first thing that happens whenever God gives us an instruction and we don't follow that instruction is that we lose our kingship. 
We lose our authority. We lose our ability to rule and to reign. Remember, we are seated with Him in heavenly places. We are ruling from that position of authority. Disobedience disrupts us from our authority to rule and reign with the Lord. And let me just say this, whoever is seated with him on that place of rulership is seated with him far above principalities, powers, and rulers of darkness of this world. That means that the enemy is under your feet when you are sitting in that place of rulership. Come on, somebody. Now watch this. That's the first thing that is lo that he's losing. And he grieved Samuel and he cried out to the Lord all night. Verse 12. So when Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul, it was told Samuel saying, Saul went to Carmel and indeed he set up a monument for himself and he has gone around, passed by and gone down to Gilgal. When Samuel... Then Samuel went to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. He is saying, I have done what the Lord, to Samuel, I have done what the Lord said to me to do. But Samuel said, What then is this bleating of the sheep in my ear, and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. In other words, he allowed his reasoning to bring him out of obeying the instruction of the Lord. In other words, God asked for Isaac, but he put Ishmael on the altar. Hallelujah. Now watch what happens. Then Samuel said to Saul, be quiet. I will tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And he said to him, speak on. So Samuel said, when you are little in your own eyes, were you not the head of the tribes of Israel? And did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? Now the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, But I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. Because whenever we allow reasoning, we modify the voice of God. Remember Ananias and Sapphira. They said, God, this is everything. You can never lie to God. Come on, somebody. Ananias, this is what happened to Ananias and Sapphira. Now listen to this. We modify the instruction. We modify what God told us in our hearts. And it brings us to the end of everything God wants for us. But the people, listen to this. And Saul said to Samuel, we're going to go to 20. And Saul said to Samuel, but I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me and brought back Agar king of Am Amalek I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites, but the people took of the plunder, the sheep, the oxen, the best of the things which have been at, which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. Good ideas can keep you from God ideas. So Samuel said, Has the Lord as great as has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fats of rams. For rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as the iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from this day from being king. So we need to understand as watchmen, when God speaks to us and he gives us an instruction, it is in our best interest to obey the instruction of the Lord to the letter. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There is safety there. Like I said, now two things. He knows the end from the beginning and he has your best interest at heart. He's not trying to rip you off. He's not trying to keep anything from you. He's not trying to deny you anything. As a matter of fact, at the end of that, there's always a blessing. There's always a blessing. If God tells you, give me Jericho, he has already planned that every city after Jericho is yours. So don't take something from Jericho because it will keep you from having victory in Ai and all the other cities after that. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Simple instruction. 
simple instruction Jericho belongs to me everything in it is mine but when you take something from Jericho it will hinder you from having victory in Ai and every other city that God has given you as a blessing and we find that because we disobeyed in one small area we are now having to deal with problems in every other area of our lives I want us this morning to just go before the Lord and say, God, help us to be obedient. Help us to come to that place of obedience. I know this can, I, 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 this is the word of the Lord. Like I said, I didn't pray prayer for this. Amen. So I'm also in that altar call that the Lord will help all of us to be obedient. To be obedient. Hallelujah. When he asks you for your Isaac, it's not because he wants to take Isaac from you. It's because he wants to release the multitudes of descendants, like the sun of the, like the stars in the sky or the suns on the seashore. That's what he was trying to get to, 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 to Abraham. He wasn't trying to take his, the love of his life, the apple of his eye, his son from him. That's not God. That's not the heart of God. He was just trying to say, listen, if you can, with the whole, if you can give me your all, I'll give you my all. Hallelujah. God already had a blessing at the, when he was about to kill his son. God stopped him in obedience. And he said, "I now I know. Now I know. Then he opened his eyes and there's a ram caught in the thicket. That ram was there all along, but his eyes were closed. He couldn't see the ram. But obedience opened his eyes to the provision that had been there all along. Some of us, it is our obedience that will open our eyes to the provision and the blessing and the doors that God has already put in front of us. Let me tell you, it is possible, possible that the way of escape, even from poverty, from sickness, from death, the way of escape can be in front of us and we not even see it. Because we have not completed the obedience. But when he put his son on the altar, his eyes were open and he saw the ram. He was there all along. But that ram was there. God showed him. And then he said, from today, you will, you've known me as all kinds of things. But today, I am your Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, your provider. His covenant with him was established as the Lord is provider from that day. He said, if you will obey me with everything, if you will do this from today, you will never lack anything. I will prove whatever you need, I'll be your provision. Hallelujah. Let's stand up on our feet right now. Shadadaboko satalabande. Father, we thank you for the teaching of your word. God, we, we ask you for the grace of doers. That we will not just be hearers of the word only, but we shall become doers of the word. I know there is a miracle behind every instruction you give us. If there is any disobedience in us. I want to, I'll, I'll name this message, The Blessing Behind Obedience. I think that's a good title. You can name it that. Vince up there. Bless God. The blessing behind obedience. Amen. Father, we ask you to speak to us. Lord, if we have been in disobedience, if our lives right now have been upended because in an area of our lives we have not hearkened, we haven't given you the offering of, of, of obedience. Lord, we ask you to forgive us this morning. We ask you to cleanse us, to purify us. Where we have made mistakes, we, we didn't wait on you. Just like Abraham, we, we received a promise, but we couldn't wait for Isaac. We created Ishmael, and now we are paying the price. Ishmael has been terrorizing us from the day we messed up. Lord, we, we were, you were, wanted to give us Isaac, but in our disobedience, in trying to help you, Lord, we have stepped out of obedience, and we have created a mess. We ask you, Lord Jesus, to have mercy on us, to cleanse us, to purify us, in every area of our lives where we have not honored you with our obedience. Lord, we thank you that your precious blood is here as we confess our sins. Lord, your word says that though our sins be as red as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Your Bible word says in 1 John that if we confess our sins, you are just and faithful to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and from all sin. And as we ask for forgiveness, we thank you that you are resetting us back. You are resetting us so that we can, we can have another opportunity to walk in obedience before you. We thank you for your redemptive power, your redemptive grace that is here even in this place. 
I know with every word there is grace in order to walk that word, to do what you have given us. Speak to us this morning and help us to acquiesce to your word. Help us to line up with your word this morning. Help us to bring our lives into alignment with your word. And we thank you, Father God, that in the name of Jesus, our spiritual eyes have been opened. Come on, begin to pray right now that you will not miss the instruction of the Lord again. You will, Lord, open our ears that your instruction will become very clear to us. That we will not miss what you say. That we will not miss what you reveal to us. Open our ears, open our eyes. Speak to us, Lord Jesus. And we thank you, Father God, that even as we have gone through your scriptures, your word, that you're causing us to be able to see the blessing of the Lord, to see those who are with us more than those who are against us. Help us to focus on the prize. Give, our focus, uh, give us back our focus. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. And so, Father God, I stretch out my hands over these people. And I pray in the name of Jesus. Let your hand be upon them. Lord, right now I pray that the blood of Jesus, the, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, will come to nullify every trap of the enemy that has been set for them. Not just this month, next month, Lord, for the rest of their life. I pray right now in the name of Jesus that every trap is sprung right now. Not just for us, but for our families, for our children, our children's children. Lord, I thank you that you're doing it for us right now. I thank you that your hand is over the generations that you have given to us. And I thank you, Father God, that even right now, there's an anointing coming for prophetic intercession. God, we thank you for that watchman anointing. Allow us, Lord, that the flesh will not put us to sleep like the disciples. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. We do warfare against the flesh now that has tried to come and steal our ability to see and our ability to hear. Father, we ask you to cleanse us, to purify us. And so we lift up our hands before you. Let there be a new ability, a new anointing coming upon us. My sheep will hear my voice. And a stranger they will not follow. Where well, we have followed strange suggestions. Today, we are cutting them off in our lives. We will almost only follow your voice. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. And if you don't know Jesus as Savior, just say this prayer after me. Say, Lord Jesus. Let's all say it together in concert. Just in case somebody out there. Say, Lord Jesus. Come into my heart. Save my soul. Forgive me of my sins. Thank you for dying for me on the cross. Thank you for writing my name in the book of life. Because I'm born again, I am changed. And because you died for me, help me live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Now, if you're watching this online or you're here and you say that prayer and you meant it from your heart, it's really an invitation. You are born again. Come and talk to one of us and we'll be able to help you along the way. Now, may God bless you. May he bless your week. I pray your property is protected and the Lord watch over your coming and your going in Jesus' mighty name. God bless you. Love you with the love of the Lord. And uh, tea and coffee is out through those doors. If you need any prayer ministry, we've got a...